The Lord be with you, everyone. It is great to be back with you. And back with you with Matthew chapter 5. And in verse 7, we got just to the idea of what mercy is last week. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's a massive subject. And I want to share the exciting heart of that with you. You see, mercy, under all its various names, you remember we said in the Old Testament it is reflected in loving kindness, that covenant word whereby God has given himself to us, that other beautiful one, the tenderness, the tender-heartedness of God, one that goes in both Testaments, the word compassion, all of these words which are facets of this word mercy. And it, it, mercy itself is a facet of that great statement, God is love. The love of God is love mercy. And so when we say it like this, it transcends any definition that the world might put on the word. So mercy, let me underline that in purple. Mercy is a facet of that love that God is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, shout it loud, is the God of mercy. Now, when I come to this verse, well, let me put it like this. When we come to these, what we call the Beatitudes, um, have you ever thought we're really describing Jesus? Each one of these Beatitudes, Jesus is revealing to us something of his own inner person. This is who he is. And this is why he lives in the state of blessedness that is total joy and peace and relationship with the Father. So he's describing himself here. It's a sort of mini autobiography. But at the same time as he addresses us with these statements, then, well, what is he doing? He's describing the life that is called eternal life, that life in which he who is life lives in us and we live in him. And therefore, these verses become our life, for his life is given into us, and we live our life from his life. So that's what we're talking about. The fact it says, merciful. Well, if God is mercy, then what is merciful except those who have received this gift of mercy in and through Jesus, and now through the Holy Spirit of Christ, they are doing and they are demonstrating God's mercy. Did you get that? The merciful are those who have received of God's mercy and are now doing that mercy in their life, wherever life happens to be for them. They are demonstrating in their words and their actions that arise from their deepest self, they're demonstrating God's mercy, uh, the, this love of God. Notice, as I say that, in the Old Testament, as I just said, um, that the word would be loving kindness. It's a great word. It, it, it's like a great umbrella across the whole of the Old Testament. And, and it's a word that is not only linked to, it's rooted in covenant. That is in the giving of God to us, the giving of his very self to us. And the result of that, coming out of that, loving kindness is his continual day by day by day, action toward us, caring for us, living for us on our behalf, loving kindness. And if you go through the Old Testament and look at that word, you will find over and over again, right in the same sentence, it will, will always say something like uh, doing loving kindness, or a favorite one is keeping loving kindness. That is, God 
Daily is demonstrating, acting, doing, being himself in our lives. So, loving kindness, that is mercy, hear me carefully, is an action word. It has no place in passivity. Do, do you follow me? Mercy has got nothing to do with someone who sits in an ivory tower in, in their study and thinks wonderful thoughts about love and compassion and mercy. No, you don't, uh, you don't think of mercy, loving kindness, and compassion in terms of just thinking about this as a wonderful idea. Every time you mention mercy, loving kindness, compassion, it is always speaking of the divine love, God's love in action. First of all, in action, doing in your life. You are the one who has received of mercy. You are. Um, and sometimes we're very aware of that. Other times we have to be prodded and woken up to realize the mercy of God in our life that has brought us to this moment. It is God's love in movement. Have you noticed that in the New Testament when it speaks of compassion, especially in the life of Jesus, it speaks of Jesus being moved with compassion. Feel that. Compassion is a personal energy, God's personal energy within you that is moving you to love. And love as an action. Love as a doing. Not love as a silly grin on your face, you know. Uh, the, the people who think that being spiritual is looking odd and weird. No, this is getting down into the dirt sometimes. This is getting your hands right there in the mud and bringing the message of God's love into the lives of broken, hopeless people. So th th this is what we're talking about. Well, how do we do this? Let, let's get a few negatives out of the way. We do not try to um, excite mercy, create mercy out of our flesh, that is, out of our mortality, uh, out of me as if I'm separated from God and I've got to do something over here to impress him. And so I, I'll try to get this compassion stuff working. I'm going to try and love. I am, yes. No, that, that's, that's not only not a good idea, it's impossible. It, it states it very clearly in the scripture, Romans 8. It says it is impossible for the flesh to please God. It's impossible. Um, it, it's, there, there's, we don't have the mechanism in the flesh. Rather, we have the reverse, and that's why it's impossible. You see, it's the flesh that believes the lie, the great lie of Satan, that we uh, fulfill our destiny by being independent of God, separated from Him. So we do our thing and uh, he's doing his thing, and occasionally we ask a little bit of help. But now that's the great lie of Satan. It's a lie because it isn't so. You cannot be separated from God. He refuses to be separated. I, I may separate myself, at least in my mind and deepest heart, but his love never leaves. His love never ceases to pursue. But the flesh, I say, believes the lie. And so lives right here. This, this is my world here. This, my little piece of mortality. And so the flesh, by definition, is always self-centered, self-satisfying, self-protecting, and all the other self things that we could add there. I'm always seeking self-advance. Now, now don't, don't get upset when I say that, because it's the truth. We, we 
naturally left to everything this flesh can do. I'm forever making sure I've got everything I need uh, and everyone else can go to hell I, as long as I've got it and, and my knuckles get white holding on to it. And all our anxiety is because we, we're afraid that we will not advance as self thinks we should and not have the protection that self thinks we should and not have the possessions that self thinks we should. And so you could say the self is infested, it's corrupted is a New Testament word, by the lie. And so how, if, if mercy, this compassion, loving kindness, if, if it is the possession of God, if it is just a, a ray of glory that comes out of the love of God, then the lie believes I'm separated. How can I get that which is uniquely God's and have that in me and through me if I am set upon a course that says I'm separated from God? He's up there, he's over there, and all the thoughts that go with it. No, uh, if I'm ever going to love with God's love and be compassionate and merciful, it is because I've realized that in Jesus Christ there is no separation. I have been resurrected into the realization of my union with him. Flesh can't see that. Flesh never will. The flesh can never produce compassion, mercy, as, as we're talking about it, because it, it, it lives in its five senses. My five senses are essentially, that, that's the expression of the flesh. It's life and reality is what I can see, what I can touch, what I can taste and smell, you know, the five senses. Um, there, there's no world beyond that. And so if we see as mercy is an act of feeling, well, then I can only be merciful when I see someone who draws out my feelings. You know, it's the pitiable state of the person that makes me merciful, if what I do is mercy. It's, it's I feel sorry for the chap, you know, so I, th I threw him a dollar, you know, was, I did something big. You know, they had nowhere to live, so I, I gave them my back room. And uh, it's, it's because of the state of the individual that this feeling that just hangs sort of in a vacuum arises and we do something, but then it's gone. There, there was a sign, I saw it on the back of a car, I remember, and um, quite frankly, it shocked me for its uh, stupidity, but I realized lots of people believed it. It, it said, if I'm remembering correctly, um, it, was, it was advising, it was a, a little thing that was telling you to do random acts of kindness and senseless acts of love. Everybody thought it was a marvelous idea. What, what, what they say? Well, they're, they're saying, just be spontaneous. If you feel like being kind, go do it. Just, you know, and think about it later. And, uh, and, and if you, you feel the, the move to love someone, well, well that, do it. It might be senseless, but it, it'll make you feel good. What, what are they saying? They are saying that there is no root to what you do. What you do, it, it's random, it, it's senseless, you just do it. There's no roots to it. You're like a mushroom that came up overnight and your roots go nowhere. And you'll be gone by uh, twilight. You, you, it, no, you see, our life, our actions and words are rooted into Jesus Christ the Lord through the Holy Spirit. And He, is God from God. So what we say and do is not just a passing thought. It's not just a whim. Oh, I think I'll do that and feel good about it. No, we are rooted into the very beating heart of God who is love. 
and therefore we do not do by feeling. We do by determination, drawing our life from our true soil. I mean, it's in the same boat that today, it's all over the place, uh, classes on forgiveness. And the whole thing reduced to that you learn how to forgive and why you should, and basically you should because, well, it will make you healthier, won't it? Yes, probably save you from a heart attack, but that, that's not forgiveness as the Bible teaches it. We forgive because our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the forgiving God. He's merciful, and that's who He is, and therefore rooted in Him, whether it's good for my health or not, I recognize this is the very life of creation, the very life of the human. Forgive. I, I'm wondrously stuck in that. My roots are in him who is forgiveness. And incidentally, yes, it's magnificent for your health. It is part of divine healing. We're rooted in God. It's not a whim. It's not just something be a jolly good idea. And tragically, of course, religion has portrayed this with, with the simple, so you've got to try and be like Jesus. I, I was at a fast food place uh, this morning just, and I saw a, a bunch of uh, teenagers and they had signs on their back that they're trying to be like Jesus, um, you know, a little bit every day. This sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But I, my heart went out to them because I know the frustration that comes with that. It's a good idea when you wrote the T-shirt, but uh, six months in and you recognize the utter impossibility of me trying to be like Jesus. We have been created and we have been reborn through the resurrection into union with God, not just being like Him, but He in us being Himself, being love, being this compassion mercy. And so we, we act. We, we don't react to a pitiable situation. We don't react to feelings that we're having. The word react is not in the believer's vocabulary. We act. We, we choose. We live by intention. And that is faith, which is resting in the being of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the gift of himself to us in Jesus, and the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, within us. And there we choose to live from there. And sometimes that's anti-feeling because those feelings that can do a happy little dance of senseless acts of love can also do some very senseless acts of rage. And so, uh, no, we, we live by choice. We live by expecting faith, trust in Him who is our life. It's the way it works. Okay, let me get this straight. When we talk like this, we're brought face to face with the reality that salvation, you know, getting saved, hear me carefully and don't, don't run away when you hear it, is not primarily about getting a pardon so you can go to heaven. <laughs> yes, I meant that. You see, primarily salvation describes deliverance from that hell hole of death and darkness and the lie into the state of being delivered, wherein is what I've just spoken of, the, the gift of God himself to dwell within us. And therefore, salvation is the personal presence of God through the Holy Spirit in me. And that personal presence is the self-giving love and merciful one. 
which means that as I live in him and he lives in me, this is where my life is going. And all P.S., when, when you die, you'll recognize that Christians don't die. We simply walk into the fullness of where we're already begun to live now. That changes life, you know. I was talking to a chap the other day and, and just right about these things. And, and, and he said, he said, well, as long as I'm going to heaven when I die, all this other stuff I don't really care about. Uh, and anyway, he said, my church told me that's deeper life, that's second experience, and I'm quite happy with my first one. Where? You see that? That's not in the Bible. Where would you get that? There's only one salvation. There's only one state of being in the life of God, and that is God himself comes and lives within us and we live within God. So this is our culture, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We live within him who is our culture. And he who now lives within us is self-giving love. It's not just a sort of nice feeling about you. It is that unbelievable, unconditional, strong love of God that by its very being must reach out to be love. Look, let me read from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and I'll, I'll sort of spot read it a bit, but let, I mean, this, this is the Word of God. This is what arises out of Jesus rising from the dead and giving to us His Holy Spirit. So let's take this very seriously. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from or out from God. And everyone who loves with this love that comes out of God is born of God and knows God. It isn't that everyone who's born again goes to heaven. That, that's all P.S. kind of stuff. He is saying that the mark of new birth is that the love of God has been deposited within us in the Holy Spirit. But he goes on, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son, into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, we didn't start this, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected, brought to its full goal in us. By this that we know we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. The Bible's very straight, you know. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we've received from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Wow, what a passage. Receive it straight from the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that word love, of course, in the original language is agape, which means this unique and only love. God is this agape love this utter self-giving, and within that is mercy, compassion, loving kindness. And so, do, do you realize what we're saying? The merciful are those that have received of the mercy you have received, you've, you've confronted, you've been embraced by, you are in the process of being transformed by this 
incredible love that comes to us in Jesus. But that love it does, doesn't just have a nice nest inside of you. That love by very nature would reach out to be merciful to others. See, this love causes us to see, what can I say, see other people as God sees them. And God shows us how he sees them when he became flesh in Jesus. And, and, and we, we see Jesus <clears throat> as he had mercy on people or compassion or acted toward them in loving kindness, in love. And maybe we need to reread the Gospels with that in mind. Jesus saw through the barriers that were placed by people that love should not happen. Jesus didn't see the barriers. He didn't see any racial barriers, none whatsoever. Nor did he see gender barriers in a, in a world that really put women down under the feet of men. Jesus raised women to eyeball to eyeball, cheek to cheek, and spoke to them some of the most marvelous words in the New Testament. Nor did he seem to be bothered by the track record of behavior of people. And that was very upsetting that, I mean, didn't he read their rap sheet? I mean, surely he, he knows what uh, terrible people these are, but he talked to them quite normally, not, not even making reference to their past behavior. And it didn't matter about their belief system. They didn't have to believe even in a coming Messiah. He just spoke to them as the Messiah who had come and met them right where they were and took them on. So he could sit down with the Samaritans, he could sit down with tax collectors, and he could sit down with Pharisees. And all of them listened, even though none of them believed that he was who he says he was, nor believed the gospel he spoke of. And yet when he spoke, it was mercy, that strong compassion that drew them to him. He accepted them. Yeah, if you're hearing what I'm saying, this is as shocking to us today as it was in the Gospels. He accepted them as the beloved of God. He accepted them as precious human beings in a broken race that were the object of his coming to come and save. I mean... We don't have time to go into this, but do you remember Jesus sat and ate with tax collectors? And you've heard me talk about this before, but just let me quickly say the tax collectors, to try and illustrate who they were, they were a sort of legalized mafia. That is, they could do all of their cheating, lying, scheming, <laughs> taking your money and do it legally because they were backed and authorized by the Roman government. Tax, they were the sworn enemies of the people. I mean, the common folk, they were ground into the dust by tax collectors. And so the people hated them. And anyone who associated with them was included in the hate. And it says, Jesus sat and ate with them. And in Bible days, as in much of the third world today, eating with someone is not just because you're hungry. Eating is a bond that is forged. It's a covenant of friendship. It was called, it had the name of table fellowship. It meant you were standing in solidarity with the person you ate with. Jesus sat, associated, and ate with these people? Or worse yet, he actually included one of them into his band of disciples, Matthew. And Matthew went on to write the Gospel of Matthew. Um, he showed his attitude toward tax collectors when he told those stories of Luke 15. Uh, and the father embracing that filthy son, kissing his 
face and skin full of pig muck. Uh, and that's how the people looked at the tax collectors, even though they were the richest people in town, but they looked at them as scum of the earth and dirty pigs. Jesus sat and ate with them and did so publicly. It wasn't a private secret meeting. But then, what do you know? He also ate with the hostile Pharisees, those religious, <laughs> religion to the max, almost defining the word. And, and, and Jesus sat and ate with them and loved them so that when they finally rejected him, he wept with great convulsive sobs and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you? Oh, what about this one? You, you know, one of the disciples, you don't hear much about him, not that we hear much about any of them, really, but um, he was called Simon the Zealot. Do you know what that's saying? A zealot would today, a zealot was a suicide bomber, um, certainly a terrorist. Uh, a zealot, there, it was a subsection of the religious folk. It was very religious, same as ISIS is today concerning the Quran. Well, the zealots were dedicated to the Old Testament, only put a twist on it that in their minds allowed them to kill at will any Roman or any sympathizer with the Romans. They carried knives up their sleeves. They had their swords and machetes hidden in the temple. And suicide, yes, because they would go into the group of soldiers and pull out the knife and kill as many as they could before inevitably they were killed. And Jesus had a Simon the Zealot in his band of disciples, public for everybody to know, made him major suspect to the Roman CIA. Yeah. Huh. He didn't have a litmus test to see if the people believed the right thing before he would talk to them and love them. He made himself very vulnerable because the, what I just described cost him, if you followed the matter historically and naturally, it led him to the cross. That was one reason, um, they, they, one reason that they crucified him because his associations were a scandal for the very name of the temple. But then, as I said before, in a, in a world where women were of no importance whatsoever, they couldn't give testimony in court because they were just not wise enough to do so. Jesus had women who were in the outer band of disciples. Um, in fact, we have their names. They, they were not just a sort of hangers-on. They, they took an important place. He spoke with, do you realize going to Samaria and Samaria, talk about racial problems. The Samaritans hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Samaritans. If, if Jew and Samaritan met on the road, that they were, it was incumbent upon each one of them to kill the other, stone the other, do some terrible work to them. Well, Jesus insisted on going through Samaria, says John chapter 4. And when the disciples go to get food, he talks to a woman, dear Lord, you're in terror. You, this is dangerous territory you're in, just for starters. And a woman, you're a man, and you're talking to a woman. Boy, you are in for trouble. But he didn't get any trouble, but he caused waves of wonder, amazement, astonishment, and horror to go, go all the way through. Do you know that the women were the first witnesses to the resurrection? Do you realize their testimony wouldn't be accepted in court? But he set it up so that it, the women were the first ones he talked to. And he washed the feet. Now, the person who washes feet is the lowest servant on the totem pole. Jesus intentionally said he rose from supper. 
He took off his outer garments. He girded with a towel. He took the water. Intention, intention, not just a whim, not just a senseless act of love, but he is intentionally taking his place as the servant, the servant of love, a slave by choice of love. And when he did that, which is often overlooked, uh, they, they hardly noticed when he first got up because it says the disciples at that point, just before Jesus goes to the cross, they're having a massive argument as to who is the greatest among them. And Jesus gets up and washes their feet. <sighs> that was compassion. That's mercy. You realize when Judas left that gathering to betray Jesus, he went with damp feet. Jesus had knelt at the feet of Judas and washed his feet. And at table, Jesus had taken that one piece of bread and dipped it in the stew and gave it to Judas, which was the custom to give it to the most honored guest. Jesus, in that final reach to Judas, gave him the honored morsel. Huh. It's amazing, the dealings of Jesus. He saw through race, he saw through gender, he saw through anti-belief systems, he threw, went straight through all past behavior and just loved people where they were. That is, he didn't have more love for some people and less for others. He just loved. And when he taught, he wasn't just giving a sermon, you know. He wasn't getting the sermon in the mail on Wednesday so that he could have it all neat and ready for Sunday. Out of his heart of love, that move of loving, it says he saw the multitudes that had been beaten up by religion and he was moved with compassion and taught them. And when he saw the sick, it wasn't that he was God's man of faith and power. No, it says he was moved with compassion. His whole innards moved out that this should never be. You see, in compassion, in mercy, there is a touch of beautiful anger. For the anger is that you should never be suffering like this. You should never be in this condition. And I rise up because I'm going to change that. I'd say that was Jesus' compassion, that he healed the sick. Today, in many areas, I, well, where I came from, that was it. You've got to have the power of God, the power of God, the power of God. Well, I agree, except we'd better define the power. For the power of God is his compassion and his love for you, that he will not let you go. He will accomplish his work in you. The compassion of God. If Jesus was looking for success, he would have avoided all of the above and made sure that he made the right friends and was found in the right places, saying the right thing to the right people. No, he wasn't interested in success. His success was loving people. That's his mercy that comes to them where they are, sits down inside their brokenness. In another parable, he called you and I pearls of great price, that he would search until he found us. In another parable, he said we were a treasure hidden in the dirt and the mud, but he comes and buys with his own life and rescues the treasure. He illustrates this mercy, this compassion with the prodigal, which you know too well, let me refer to it. The, the, the man comes home and all he can ever think is that his dad will give him some sort of part-time job. But instead, he's embraced with a bear hug of compassion, kissed all over and carried into the feast. And I, I hear some of you say, yes, but they, Jesus said they were lost, lost. And I love the way some people, well, I don't love the way some people, that was a bad expression. Uh, we say lost. You know, I was raised to say it. You sneer it. It comes down through your nostrils. They're lost, meaning damned in hell. We're not. No, you read. 
And the word lost? Lost means something of great preciousness has gone missing, and I cannot rest until I found it. Must be found. I cannot rest until it's found. That's lost. That's how God looks at us. That's how Jesus revealed the mercy of God. And he's in us. He saw through race. He saw through behavior. And he never compromised who he was, never compromised what he said. He simply joined people where they were, not where they ought to be, not going over all their paths, just where they are. He joined them to be himself, the Savior, the I am the way, to be himself who is the good news. Nor did he ever apologize to the scandalized crowds. He just was love and loved and loved and loved and showed mercy and was moved with compassion. And this is the Jesus. Christ is in you. Do you get it? This is the gospel. It isn't that God sort of loved you in some vague kind of way, and if you said the right words and prayed the sinner's prayer, uh, then, then you're okay. You, you've got it, you see. You'll go to heaven when you die. The gospel is that God himself in Jesus Christ has come, has joined us, the human race, to himself, and has carried us through death, brought us in resurrection, given to us the Holy Spirit to be the very presence of Father and Son within us. And this is our life now. This is being a believer, that the fullness of God's love has been poured out into your heart. This is your identity. This is, yes, it's your identity card. Who are you? Pull out the card. I am a man in whom Jesus Christ lives through the Holy Spirit. I'm a woman in whom Christ now lives. I'm seated with him in the heavens. And you see, this is how God sees you. So when we go off on all of our whining and complaining that we're no good and a worthless sinner, God doesn't hear that because God doesn't see you that way. He sees you in the reality that Jesus is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world, that Jesus is the one who through resurrection has reborn you, and you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the branch of the vine in whom the Spirit of the vine lives. You see, the objective, the objective of salvation, the reason his love came to you is that you might be the children of your Father who is in heaven. Uh, and children means you share the same nature. L listen, let me read from this message that he gave there on the side of the hill. Uh, but further on, down in verse 44, it said, Matthew 5, 44, it says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Oh, come, don't read this quickly. Take a week to read this. Let it sink in. Pray for those who persecute you in order that you might be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. He said, you are here to reveal the very nature of God your Father through the Holy Spirit. He, it says, causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? What's the, I mean, that's, yeah, any, do not even the tax gatherers do that. If you greet your brothers only, that is, those that you recognize to be like me, like the Pharisees did, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles, those people outside the covenant, do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect 
uh, that's a, no, it, it means you, you to have reached God's goal for you. you. You should have stepped into God's destiny for you. You have become mature in who you are in Christ. Therefore, you are to become perfect, mature. That is, God is love. Therefore, you are to exhibit the character of your Father. Well, what about Luke 6, 35? That, that's uh, another take on this. He says, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Do you accept this as the Word of God to you? Just a question. Your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High. You see, he's saying again that you will exhibit the character, the family traits. For he, your father, himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Do not judge, you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Pardon, you will be pardoned. Give, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure will be measured to you. He, he said, and I need the, we use that to describe money many times. No, it applies to the whole of life. As you give, so you have plunged into the river that God is always flowing into you and out of you. Okay, this is the good news. This is the gospel, you see. And, and I trust the, the, the Holy Spirit is opening your eyes. You say, how did I miss this? Because nobody told you. And, and now I'm telling you, this is the gospel. This is what it means to be a Christian. And the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and opens our eyes yet more, not only to see this is the way it is, but reveals to you what Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. This is not some terrible a burden laid on you to try and be like Jesus. It's the glorious news that Jesus himself through the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. He, he lives in you without displacing you, uh, and you live inside of him without displacing him. Oh, by the way, I, I've seen a lot on the web recently. Can I quickly say this? It, we, we don't become him. He never ceases to be he. I never cease to be me. Ten quadrillion years from now, I will still be Malcolm with the uniqueness that God made me. But he is in Malcolm and Malcolm's in Christ. We haven't become a sort of blob. I haven't become the I am. I haven't become God. I am in him and he's in me. And because we're built into and on the foundation of the Holy Trinity, where the Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And the Father is not God without the Son and the Spirit. And Jesus is not God without the Father and the Spirit. But it's not a blob. Look, union with God is not to be absorbed into him. He is in us, and in us the Holy Spirit now is therefore in my heart attitude. And, and, and I realize that as I am aware, my attitude would change, my worldview, my thoughts, my emotions, my imaginations, my intentions. That's where the Holy Spirit is working to bring us into line with who we are. We're not trying to be like him. We're being brought into line now with who we truly are. We are. And of course, to act in unlove is to act contrary to who we really are. Isn't it sad that in so many churches today, Believers are known for their judgmental looks, their judgment words, their threats, 
as they hand out law and presenting themselves as better than everybody around them. Tragic, tragic. When we are to be the burning, white-hot fire of love in every community. Yeah, that's the way it is. Um, we... Why, why is it that we who are this, every one of you I speak to, Christ is in you, why, why, why is it we've missed this? Well, as I just said, we haven't been taught it. Took me a number of years to come like a butterfly out, out of the tomb in which I'd been placed by, by leaders of, of the church that it was all on you. You've got to try and do this. And, and I, I came out to, to recognize these truths. And you say, well, you know, I, I, I do this. I'm, I'm a, I speak my mind, which, of course, is never a merciful person. Um, I, I get angry and well, the rest of it. We, we list the things that we are and we say we're, you know, we're not like Christ in any way. Well, you see, the fact is... If, if, if the death and resurrection of Jesus be that dividing of all things and the entrance of a new creation and that we were crucified with Christ and we now live and Christ is our life, then what we're doing, it isn't... You see, you don't have a sin nature. That's not in the Bible either. Um, rather, you, you have a... You've been acting out of your old habitual way of life. You know, your, your ancestors acted that way. Your, your mother always told you that's who we are. And, and so uh, that's who you, you are. Now, now take a break and realize that's not true. Not true anymore. You've woken up. You came to know Jesus. And, and you no longer live by a way of life that was handed down to you by your ancestors who gives you your identity. This is who you are. And all your peers and you know, so-called friends, they tell you, this is who you are. No, you're not. That, that's out, out of ignorance. You Sit back. T take, take the next month just to realize. Let the Holy Spirit baptize your heart and mind in the reality. You were crucified with Christ. That you that you think is you is not you. That was crucified with Christ. And recognize that Christ himself is your life. And the Holy Spirit is working in you. It's in Philippians 2, is it verse 12, that God is at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's talking about you. And the fruit of the Spirit in you is love and joy and peace. Stop in this madness of saying, this is who I am, and realize this is the truth. Christ in you is who you are. Holy Spirit filling in your life with the very character of God. Um, I, I could speak a lot more on all of that. Maybe we will one of these days. Um, but the time is going. And I, I want you to recognize this union that you are. It means that you now... And I know this could be the first day of uh, the newness of life for you. Um, you've got you to learn. Jesus said, you know, come to me, uh, learn of me, learn of me. It's very important because we've got the impression that, you know, if you accept Jesus, kaboom, everything has suddenly changed and you are, well, that... Uh, in many churches I've been to, everybody is living in chosen denial. No, it's the emperor has no clothes and no one's about to tell him because he thinks he has. And so, so everybody thinks, well, you know, we, we've got it made and we never have any failure. No, come on, come on. We're, we're, if you haven't understood this before, then we're babes and we have to learn a whole new way of life. We don't live by the habits handed on by our ancestors. We, we don't live just by the fads of this world and kicked like a football and reacting to people. No, we live by choice, 
faith choice, faith in the fact Christ is my life. Live by intention. I choose. I choose to be here. I choose now to let Christ be my life in this moment. So I don't react to people. I choose how I respond. I choose what I do. It's not out of my feeling. Oh, there's feelings to this, all right. Glorious feelings, but they're rooted in choice, intention. You own your life in Christ. Well, I'm trying to say, no one can make you do this or make you, you know, though the, the world uh, gets away with it by, by saying, well, she made me do it. No, she didn't. No, no, you did it by uh, a reaction. So she actually is your slave master if, if she can make you do that. No, own your life. Christ is your life and I own that fact. So that walking into this situation, I choose. It's Christ my life. Not directed by other people and reacting to them in what they say or do. Of course, um, you'll find people will be as horrified with you as they were with Jesus because you're not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to be anxious, you see. You're, you're supposed to get mad and angry and kick and throw things around. You're supposed to want revenge and you're supposed to say, I'll get even. You're supposed, you're supposed, you're supposed. But of course, not in Christ. That's a whole new way of life. And it says of these people, they shall receive mercy. You don't earn it. It's not saying be merciful and you'll receive mercy. It is that you don't know anything of the love of God until you translate that love who is in you into love action. And when you translate it into actual acts of mercy and love, suddenly you realize the reality of the mercy that God has toward you. Do you, do you understand? Um, if you just think about these things and think in your head that they're true, it's more like a fantasy, almost a myth. <clears throat> it's got to get out into action. And when we do it, it's the same with, you know, that, that verse in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You don't earn forgiveness by forgiving, but you sure realize the forgiveness of God the moment you forgive. You see, so I have a problem forgiving. No, you don't. You are, you, you, you're still very blurry on what God has done for you. If you realize his forgiveness and translate that into forgiving others, then you'll realize afresh what God has done for me. I know God's love as I love others. I know his mercy as I give mercy to others. And so on. You could say it's the physical dimension of faith. Faith isn't just a fuzzy feeling inside. You say, I believe these things. You don't believe them until they're part of your life and action and they're imprinted in, into your actions and words. And then you step back and realize just how much he is to you. I tell you what, you're like the Lake of Galilee at that point because Galilee, all the waters of the Jordan River coming down from the high mountains flow into Galilee. And at the other end of the lake, they flow out to become the River Jordan flowing down to the Dead Sea. But of course, the Dead Sea, River Jordan flows in, but it doesn't flow out. And so you get that indeed Dead Sea. We are like Galilee. We give mercy and in so doing, awaken to the vastness of God's mercy flowing into us. That, that's what it means when you give. Because in the New Testament, giving is looked upon as an act of mercy. You're being merciful to those you give to. And, and it says give and, and you'll, you'll receive. Um, well, that, it's not a get-rich-quick program. Only the flesh could have come up with that one. No, it, it means that he gives physically, materially, financially. These are gifts of God. One of the, in order that I might have more to give. 
And as I give, I realize there's more to give. So my, my faith in God's provision is physical in my giving, in the expectancy he's giving to me. Oh, I could keep talking about this, but the time has gone. And so I just say one more time that this person, like all the others we've looked at, this person is blessed. That is, they live in a divine joy and contentment and satisfaction. Blessed are the merciful. The world thinks they're nuts. But blessed are the merciful, for they live in the lake of receiving mercy, in union with the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. So to that end, I now bless you. Bless you in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that your eyes shall be opened to see His mercy, and to realize His mercy in your life, and to become a source and a center of mercy to all with whom you meet. So I bless you. Let it be so. Amen.